works like magic. Throughout history, TLC Equation has brought to life the most extraordinary teams, leaders, and cultures the world has ever seen. Words and ideas can change the world. From Aurelius to Roosevelt, Ford to Musk, Marriott to Airbnb, Olympians, Navy SEALs, and professional athletes. Limits, like fears, are often just an illusion. TLC Equation is timeless, industry agnostic, and a proven blueprint used throughout history by ordinary people who went on to architect extraordinary visions, impacting billions of lives. That goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. I am your host, Joe Musselman. Welcome to TLC Equation, the show that explores certain universal truths behind the greatest teams, leaders, and cultures on Earth. Powered by Caspian Studios, subscribe now to TLC Equation, everywhere podcasts can be found. BVVC is a dual horizon venture fund dedicated to accelerating proven national security technology while allowing first look access to special operations and the commercial sector partners that matter most. We created BV from inception to invest in mission first founders developing next generation technology companies. Our technologies have enormous commercial applications and the potential to provide US special operations with cutting edge real time prototypes to leverage for the broader defense sectors of the United States and our allies everywhere. BV targets early seed, early growth stage companies focused on the evolution from first adopters to mass market. In a world where innovation must collide with duty, there stand pioneer founders who envision a safe and extraordinary future for the United States and our allies. I'm Joe Musselman, founder and managing partner at BVVC. And throughout this production, I hope to share with you our mission first founders who are developing next generation tech companies with one objective, to reaffirm America's position as the world's leader in computer software, hardware, and smart manufacturing technologies. To know more about our commitment to reshape tomorrow, please visit bvvc.com. Let's reimagine defense to protect our future together. So uh, one thing I noticed too in earlier conversations, you've mentioned before that you have a, you ignored podcasts for a long time. And so I love that because I, I did too for a very long period of time. It, it's like, I, I didn't know why I needed to do it. And um, I didn't know why it became such a big thing. But eventually I recognized that like, if I want people to actually hear about the importance of something, I probably should do one or two. <laughs> um, so I'm curious what, what, uh, you know, how did, why did you ignore it for a while? And then why now with figure, are you starting to come out of, um, hiding from podcasts a bit? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I, uh, I don't know. It feels like a distraction to building good product and shipping product. You know, I think, uh, in, in the limit, like a, like a company really exists, uh, does not like ship useful products and services. Me being on podcasts, you know, too much, I think it's like a net, probably net hurtful to that. To that vision. So we're trying to be more transparent with the public on what we're doing around AI systems, uh, right. the robotics work, um, timelines, uh, the intent of the program. And um, I think it's, you know, helpful if I spend, you know, less than 1% of my time here yep. uh, educating the world on what we're doing. And um, yeah, just being open about what we're, what we're building. No, I love it, man. I think it's I think it's spot on. And your first two builds were so important to this build. And um, I just appreciate your time. We'll try to make this this one percent of your time, talent, and uh, uh, worth it. And and the way I choose guests, by the way, just for your essay, I I usually try to find folks for two reasons. One that I've invested in because I've clearly gone through a set of diligence on the individual, on the business, and I'm excited about it. And then two, people that I would absolutely throw my hands up in the air, quit my job and go work for. So, um, and I love my job. So I don't, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to be, you know, flip about that. I love my job, but you're doing something that is really special, man. So I'm excited to jump into the conversation and, and just to give you some background on where this came from. So our conversation today, it's more of a riff, um, 
around an important equation and framework that I discovered that I call TLC equation. TLC stands for Teams Leadership and Culture. Uh, and essentially, there are key drivers and variables that are always in play around a founder's journey. Uh, vision, mission, values, principles, ethos, uh, and then those attract extraordinary teams, leaders, and a culture. That's TLC equation in a nutshell. Uh, and we only speak with founders and others who have shown to be absolutely exceptional in their thinking according to those key drivers. So I've heard you say leading up to this point, vision, mission, values, vision, mission, values, vision, mission, values. It's something that you believe in deeply. Uh, so, you know, I, I, that's why I wanted you to, to, to be part of this. And with every great founder, man, there comes a usually with every extraordinary founder, there, there's usually a meaningful origin story uh, around the founder itself. So tell me, let's start off by just saying, you know, tell me a story that helps our audience understand who you come from. So I, so I was born in the Midwest. Um, I grew up uh, in a small town in Illinois. Um, hey, I picked, I'm speaking to you from Chicago. <laughs> nice. That's great. Um, yeah, we grew up, grew up on like a third generation farm, like racy raising corn, corn and soybeans. So grew up working pretty hard <laughs> and, yeah. um, you know, like grew my, my family parents were just very entrepreneurial. Um, and I kind of knew from a young age, I just wanted to go off and build things. And that's what made me, yeah. you know, I really enjoyed that work and, uh, you know, starting in high school and college, I started building software companies, um, you know, internet companies. And, um, that was just like, you know, fun, just like enjoyed, you know, yeah. building stuff, shipping things, learning, iterating. And, um, that basically rolled into like 10, you know, 10, 14 years in building internet companies. Um, and then I sold a, my last software company called Vettery in 2017, 2018. Um, and that's when I got into AI and hardware. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. I want to, I want to poke a little bit at that. So a lot of folks, one, you're from the Midwest. So go Midwest. Uh, we hear the constant phrase of Midwestern values. Often, uh, you grew up with two farmers who are entrepreneurs. What does that mean to grow up with two parents who are farmers and entrepreneurial? A lot of people do not understand what that means if they don't come from the Midwest, like growing up, waking up on a farm, doing, you know, serious collateral duties every single day for your parents' business. So I'm curious, what was that like, like growing up with two parents who were farmers? Yeah, it was great. I mean, my parents are great. Uh, like I, um, it, you know, it was definitely, it was, I think it definitely helped instill like a pretty strong work ethic. I would say we woke up early. We, you know, we were put to work basically when we weren't, at school, things like that. Yeah. I think, um, you know, definitely, I think Midwest has like really good people, good values. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it taught me a lot about working hard and it taught me a lot about, I think in some way entrepreneurship, like you got to go out and get your hands dirty and go build stuff. Um, but yeah, it was great. I mean, it was definitely very different. Like, uh, culturally like we i grew up in like yeah. a dry dry town in the midwest you know right. like extremely religious like area and um you know like i think there was like less like 800 people in our town so like oh. you know going from that to like college and you know now I like lived in new york for quite a long time and now yeah. in palo alto in california like is a very different world yeah <laughs> um yeah I love that. I love talking about, you know, the the kind of the origin story of teams, leadership, and culture for founders. The first team you were a part of was your family. The first leader that you followed were your parents. The first culture that you were a part of were your family, your extended family, and and the people that were closest, nearest, and dearest to you. You know, the one thing I get obsessed with is that first part of the equation when I talk about vision uh, and that point of inception. Um, we've, you know, you've mentioned before that you were interested from a young age on aspects of the business at, at figure. Uh, but how did those early interests in your life from your first two companies, how did they layer into preparing you to the inception moment of figure? To me, that's one of the most fascinating moments <clears throat> is when you realize that, that the two businesses you built before this perfectly prepared you for what you're building right now. When was that moment of inception? 
I mean, I think there's a, I think there's a few different like transitory states that happened here. I think the first is, um, like just just getting like well equipped to build and design things from scratch and build product and services, build an organization, mm-hmm. run that organization, get the customers, get unit economic positive in a lot of those areas. Like that's just a there's a steep learning curve there. Um, I think you know, large part coming off the my software like side of my world, I think I got a good experience on building multiple different things and building the brand, building the product, building the company, um, capitalizing the business. Like um those those were like I would say really good experiences overall. Um mm-hmm. like selling my software company is probably a pivotal milestone where I could afford to do things in like maybe what we call deep tech now. I mean that stuff like 10 years ago, five years, even maybe five years ago, no, like there wasn't traditional venture funding in these businesses. Like, I think people think that, um, you know, like conventional wisdom is like, you know, a normal venture fund would fund like a SpaceX, Tesla, Rivia, and like that didn't happen. Like, those groups That's are right. all passed. <laughs> yeah. It was like, yep. you know, only until like, uh, okay, Tesla's now like putting rockets in orbit with a billion dollar NASA contract. Do like, you know, a lot of these groups want to come in. Um, it's the same for Archer. When I started Archer, like, there was real, there was just, there was just no appetite for this stuff. Um, it, you know, I'll, I'll call it like, per, you know, Archer was a pretty hard project where we were building electric aircraft from scratch. We have to certify, I have to certify there. We have to certify the aircraft with the FAA. It takes a large team. It takes billion plus dollars of capital. You have to design all the components from scratch, the electric motors, mm-hmm. the battery systems, control software, the aircraft design, which we all did in house. We designed at, you know, now like five generations of aircraft that are designed, uh, at Archer. So like. That, you know, and then coming off of software, I had to like convince everybody that I could do that. So I think oh you know the pivotal moment was I could self fund that first part of that journey and demonstrate my ability to build aircraft, build a team, and understand hardware. And that was an, another steep learning curve. I think I went through in 2018, 2019, 2020, um, where I actually uh, could demonstrate my ability to actually build and deploy hardware, uh, mm-hmm. and software hardware. I would say overall, um, and I think you know. The experience there in hardware and shipping, you know, sh- like getting product out the door and uh, being able to like actually kind of control my destiny from a capital perspective, I think is, is maybe enabling me to be able to work on the figure project here, which is yeah. a very difficult project where we have to design basically a humanoid robot from scratch. We have to integrate AI systems into the robot basically from scratch. Uh, we have to do that on a timeline that's like somewhat tractable. We can't wait 10, 20 years to put a robot into the world. We have to do that in the single digit years. Mm-hmm. Um, we have to track people that are probably the best in the world at bipedal locomotion controls and embedded software and mechanical system design like across the board that are very niche, very hard at the frontier, like almost at the bleeding edge of where the technology stands. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I think all of those, you know, combined, um, kind of en- enable me to get a shot at doing this, I guess. Yeah. Something that really inspired me the first time that we spoke was your crystal clarity around what the world would look like if this were a massive success. So like that's, to me, that's that's something that I look for in founders because with clarity comes followership. And with followership comes a sense of humility that you know you have been tasked with a serious responsibility to make this a success for people other than yourselves. It's much bigger than yourself. So I'd love for you to bring people into that vision on what would the world, I know that it, I know that just with research for this podcast, you, you all do OKRs a little differently around the company. You have your, your near-term goals, your sprints, and then you have your 10-year vision. Uh, and for the folks that are listening, go on the website at figure.ai, look at the 10-year vision. It's, it's open source for everyone to see, uh, which I really appreciate that level of transparency. I think people should know the long-term vision of the company. Uh, but for you, tell me about that. Bring the audience into what a 10 year vision looks like, uh, the way that you've brought me into it before. What figure is doing here is we're designing a humanoid robot. Um, a humanoid, uh, anthropomorphically is, um, has a human kind of form. So we have legs that can walk around. We have arms and hands that can grab and move objects. We have camera, a computer vision perception system that can see the world and understand what's happening. Um, and we have AI systems on board that can teach the robot how to do things. And the beauty of this is the whole world that we interact with today was built around a human. Mm-hmm. It's not as if like the human's the best form factor. It's as if the the whole operating system that we live in, the physical world, was built so that we can interact with it with the human form. We have 
you know, doors that we walk through. We have stairs. We have right. specialized tools and machinery. Like it's just, it's just we set up this world. We built this world so that we can work with it. Yeah. And so it's like we're almost like a key in a keyhole in some way. So you really, um, if you want, if you want to build a general purpose robotics program to interact with that world physically, you build a humanoid form. It's mm-hmm. for sure the right form factor. Uh, it's a similar to like analogies if you want to build uh, to interact with the digital world, like the web, web and internet mm-hmm. stuff. You build you, you, the interaction mechanisms are the keyboard and mouse. Like that's how you interact with the whole digital world today. Right. Um, so what we're trying to do is deploy autonomous humanoid robots into the physical world to do like real work. Uh, that'll be real work that um, across many different areas. First is we're looking at the commercial market where we can deploy robots into uh, you know, actual companies to do work today in warehousing, retail, logistics, uh, manufacturing, just uh, every company is experiencing significant labor shortages mm-hmm. that need help and they can't figure out how to automate what the humans are doing in the facilities today. Uh, there's just no solution. And then over time, uh, the robot will learn how to do more and more things. It will learn by just looking, interacting with the world and collecting data and training that across our AI data engine. We will, over time, be able to put humanoids into the home that will do everything you physically that you don't want to do today. Um, and in the limit, in the next couple decades, I, I think, I believe that every human will own a humanoid to do work. Mm-hmm. Um, just like you own a, f- co- like a phone or, or car today. Um, and that humanoid will do work for you. Uh, I will do errands. Uh, it'll do everything you know possible in your life. Um, and that is that all of this is enabled by kind of two big things. You have, I think there's a hardware enablement today and there's a software, uh, enablement. The, the hardware enablement is really, um, the like electromechanical ability to build a humanoid fully electric. So batteries and motors and, um, I, I would say different, like, uh, different components and, and centers inside of there that allow it to be uh, low cost allow it to actually work throughout to like be able to be powered throughout the whole day uh, and be safe. Um, so our robot today, if you watch like the unveiling videos, it's walking around mm-hmm. like a human. Uh, we're interacting with the world like a human and we're doing all that. We think in a way that we can put robots next to humans long-term. Um, so, uh, and the second side is software. So um, control layers, neural nets, like things like that. So um we have bipedal locomotion controllers today that you can walk a basically a two-legged robot very stably today, and you really couldn't do that 10 years ago. And we have like the AI systems around uh, algorithms and computation to um, deploy robots autonomously and train them that weren't mm. available ten, 10 years ago. So um, yeah, I think you know, getting back to your point, I think there's a chance we're having like maybe an order of 10 billion humanoids on the planet the next like. It, like at, the, at some point in our lifetime. Yeah, that's remarkable. Some paths are forged through relentless grit, unwavering dedication, and a touch of destiny. Meet Rebecca Rouse and Joel Del Rosario, two souls whose journeys epitomize these virtues. Rebecca, a force in the weightlifting arena, stands out resolutely among the nation's finest. And then there's Joel, a Marine Corps warrior with nearly two decades of service marked by multiple combat deployments in a Purple Heart, awarded for the sacrifices made in the line of duty. Together, their shared spirit of tenacity, honor, and resilience culminated in a vision, Semper Stronger. This isn't just a fitness initiative, it's an institution forged from valor and ambition. It beckons those with the heart of a champion, offering not just routines, but transformational journeys. Their workouts, whether centered around the finesse of a kettlebell or the might of a barbell, are designed for the dedicated, those who pursue mastery with every heartbeat. And a special shout out to our brave first responders and military personnel. Semper Stronger reveres your dedication, crafting a regimen that's every bit as resilient as you are. For those with an insatiable thirst for excellence, where challenges are but milestones on the road to greatness. Semper Stronger is your anthem. Join their legacy. Immerse yourself in excellence at SemperStronger.com and connect with them on social media at SemperStronger.
Thinking of a commercial robot versus an in-home robot, I know these are uh, far apart from each other from from happening, but mechanical design, locomotion, sensing, perception, processing, computation, all these things, how, how do you take those into consideration to potentially be different from the one that you see in a warehouse versus the one that you see in a home? I think it's the same exact hardware and software systems. Mm-hmm. I think everything's the same. Mm-hmm. You really want... The, the, the like holy grail in robotics here is designing a robot with a universal interface. Like we, we, we basically want to design a robot that can do many useful things with one piece of hardware. That's, that's just missing today in our yes. lives. We're building all these like specialized sure. things across the world. We will continue to do that. In a lot of cases, it makes more sense than a humanoid. And then we have all these things that like humans do today. We're not sure how to automate them really well. And it's just, it becomes intractable to build thousands of right. startups that all need good hardware, good software, good AI data engine systems for training to tackle this. It just becomes like yes. too difficult logistically to make that happen. You really want to invest behind a general purpose interface. Yeah. And we, in the humanoid is the right form factor to do that in. Um, so it's the same, like our hardware today that we have now in our lab that we've been demonstrating, you know, online, uh, is we, we think it's almost like hardware feature complete to do everything. Um, there are some, there are some small things that we'll make improvements mm-hmm. on and on computation sensors, CPU, GPU over time, uh, like we'll, we'll continue to iterate. And I think there's probably sure. maybe some iterations on the hands to make, to do like fine grain dexterous manipulation, like. You know, we we have hands today that will work in industrial solutions, but likely not the right hands to cookie dinner in your home. Um, but largely, we think we're yep. hardware complete to do everything a human can do long term today. Yeah, you know, it's when I when I walk around warehouses, when I go through a, a, a newly minted Amazon warehouse, when I go through a a three M shop, when I go to a Tesla factory, when I go to any automotive factory. Less and less, less and less humans, more and more and more robots. Uh, and obviously, I know that um, you know folks are are having a very deep conversation all over the world regarding labor, the shortage of labor, uh, and these kind of labor intensive jobs. Uh, and people are scared they're going to be losing their jobs. But I see this. You described it beautifully in an earlier conversation. You talked about the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis, and they're all going to converge at this point where I don't actually see. Um, too much labor being lost. Some, mo- I don't see so many jobs being replaced. I think it's all going to collide in time at a point where the robot is needed. Um, so talk to us how you think about that, the, the labor that is there existing, how it's evolving, and and where the humanoid will come into play. Yeah. the I would say there's a, there's a big misconception here on the market commercially as we're deploying robots. And the conventional wisdom is that we're putting robots into these commercial applications. So like we're putting robots in to do warehousing work or manufacturing work and we're displacing like all these people. And like, mm-hmm. what do we do with those people? Uh, like we're taking jobs from, you know, Americans, from humans. Uh, that couldn't be further. Like, it's completely wrong. It's just a false. Uh, if you actually go into, if you walk into a warehouse or manufacturing facility today, what you're hit with is an enormous labor issue where 100% annual turnover, uh, $8,000 per new hire uh, in costs, 15% of employees don't show up today, um, extremely unreliable labor that doesn't want to actually do the application and do the work. We, If you look at the macro environment, we have baby boomers that are retiring out of the mm-hmm. labor force. There's about 3.3 billion humans working today in the world. Baby boomers are a big chunk of that retiring out. And then on the bottom end, we have, um, we've been having like one child per household, which is under the replacement value for humans. We need two point, a little over two uh, kids Mm -hmm. per household to maintain like the amount of humans on the planet. So our our labor force is shrinking. We have 10 million open jobs in the US that nobody wants. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to do that work. So we walk into a warehouse and manufacturing facility, they're, they're struggling every day with like how to get this work done so they can get product out the door. Uh, it's not as if we'll take jobs. They, they can't even find people to do this. Uh, the, the work is also um, very dull, dangerous, and somewhat, a lot of times dirty. Like it's just, uh, mm-hmm. you know, unloading things out of a truck when things are falling yeah. on you. It's in a warehouse with no AC and it's 120 degrees. 
Um, the conditions are just very harsh. You're walking 10 miles a day. You're touching 50 objects an hour. It's uh, They're losing people to Ubers instead, where they're making just as much money sending their car, driving around in AC. Mm -hmm. So there's this enormous problem that's happening. It's happening globally. And what are we going to do? Like, what, what are we going to do to help grow the economy? What are we going right. to do to help bring co costs down globally? Um, if a humanoid is able to be deployed to do this physical work, um, the majority of goods and services prices are driven by human costs. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they're like even machinery in a lot of ways is this derivative product of what human like, of human labor. Right. So, it, you know, if you have a humanoid doing this, it's relatively inexpensive, and you have a lot of them doing it. It should have a over time a tremendous impact on lowering the prices of goods and services, which is um, it's ultimately how everybody becomes wealthier. If we can ultimately bring the cost of goods and services down. It, um, it means there's much more abundance for the world in terms of those those goods and services globally. So what we hope to do here is deploy robots into the physical labor market to help with that labor shortage, to help do the jobs that are hurting people that people just don't want to do today. And then over time, be able to scale uh, into consumer applications, which is for us, like, how do we put humanoids in the home? How do we help colonize space? And then how do we help care for the elderly? Uh, I think those are all tremendous industries that humanoids will play a very significant role in or in the future. You know, as an investor, I sit back, I look at a lot of stuff, um, hundreds of deals all the all the time, and and sometimes businesses just don't find the right timing with the right market. Uh, how are you so certain that this is the time for this right now? This idea, it's meet the moment. You're going to push it into reality. Um, I'd love to know how you thought about that. Uh, axiomatically, it's all um, it all tails back to the product can be built and shipped. Yes, it's not. We're not sitting here right now waiting for some technology to be invented or trying to invent some technology that's never the world's never seen to make this happen. It's not the mm -hmm. case. You can come in our lab right now and you can see a humanoid walking around, grabbing objects and moving them around very close to human speeds. Right. And doing real application work, which we haven't released all that work, but we're doing that right now in our facility. You can now see if we make a bunch of improvements very fast, mm -hmm. how that's going to go from doing that pretty well to do that extremely well, and how we're going to integrate, um, consume the computer vision data uh, and sensor data off the robot to train it better every day. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's like this, like, um, it's like this logarithmic improvement that we're making here uh, over time. For us, it feels very easy to see. Mm -hmm. um, the difficulties will be, it's a very complex product and making it reliable all day autonomously is a tremendous, it's like a tremendous hurdle. Mm -hmm. But we have not in this world today seen a, a useful humanoid doing something that you look at and say somebody would pay money for. That's never happened in history. And we're doing... Right now in our lab, what is the early innings of that right now, where you can see it done end to end autonomously? And everyone who's listening needs to know that you went from zero to one robot in under twelve months. Uh, I think that's super important. That's never been done. I cross checked it. No one's created something like this uh, in the world, in the history of the world, in zero to twelve months. So I'm I'm very proud of you that you've done that. And to get more of the mission focus, the mission mission centric stuff. You talk a lot about highly capitalized, recruit recruit top talent in the world, work hard, and everyone needs to be fully committed. Uh, and then there's a chance to build the world's largest business. I love the way that you've, you've phrased that in the past. Um, in one of your first businesses, you did around 20,000 interviews. <laughs> so I, I think that, you know layering that on recruiting for top talent and that it goes to show you what a, I'd love for you to talk about the talent that you've recruited to date and why... I believe it's 58 out of the 60 people that you've recruited um, can code and are engineers. Um, and then the two people you've brought with you are from other organizations that I'm sure you trust near and dear. Um, so talk to us how the early composition of the, the team, the leadership, and what's growing there uh, at Figure. We have right now, I think, 63 employees here. Um, almost everybody here is an engineer. Um, and our culture is such that everybody does work. Directors, CTO, myself, like mm -hmm. we're all either catting or coding all day. Yeah. Uh, 
So we don't have like a hierarchy where people are managing other people and sitting around doing 360 reviews every week and doing 101s. Like we're uh, building and shipping product. Um, the entire organization was structured to ship product and ship product fast. And that's ultimately how we're going to have the biggest impact in the world. Our big impact in general is shipping useful product and services into the market that are actually helping mankind. Like we really want to yeah. do that. Yeah, uh, I love the only that. Way we, the only way we can do that is we got to move fast and we got to solve the problems and it's got to work. Uh, we just don't have, we don't have like a limited time. Like this is not like a come to work 40 hours a week and we get there. Like we will, if that, if that's, if that's our philosophy, we will, this, this, the program is too difficult technically and we will for cert, like certainly fail. Yes. Um, one of my favorite <laughs> quotes around talent is we recruit for talent with character and not, and not talented characters. And so the best candidates for your executive team must understand this and the and and understand an integrity before they even got to you. So how do you qualify and quantify for character? How do you interview for that? Getting to the core of of some of the folks that are working with you. Yeah, I think you know we really um, we really spend a lot of time here on the recruiting side. We I, I would say almost like too much time. Uh, like, um, my CTO was like with me a couple weeks ago. He's like, I just think your guys are, you're being a little bit too picky here with some hires. Yeah. Like these are really good, talented people you're bringing in, like the top PhD, uh, you know, candidates, the top roboticists at X, Y, and Z company. And he's like, we're just like, you know, and, and talent is extremely important to me, bringing the right folks in mm-hmm. and aligning that talent to what we're doing here. You could say culture, you could say mission, mm-hmm. vision, whatever you want to say here. Uh, like a shared vision is extremely important to me. So when starting the business, one of the first things I did was write a, our mission, vision values. Mm-hmm. B is I wrote a master plan, which is like a 10 year outlook. It's on the website. It's public. And it's like, you can expect this if you come here and you can expect not to see this as well. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're very explicit about if you're this type of person, we think you'll do well here. And if you're not this, then this is not the right place for you to come. And I would say it's we're, really unique i would say culture we're trying to build to tackle like one of the hardest engineering problems we've ever seen um we interview a lot for values are really important we really want you know Mm -hmm. we have a no asshole policy we want folks that are aligned to our corporate values and our personal values um we want folks that are like uh that can grow through the organization as we get bigger and they're not just like at a point where they're um you know when, when we scale as an organization, all startups go through this weird issue where the folks that are there relatively early that are wearing multiple hats, uh, mm-hmm. then ultimately have to transition to a spot where they know a lot about very little, and it becomes very tr- like hard for that growth period. So we want to find folks that can get through that period uh, well and grow themselves here under that type of or, uh, organization. And then lastly, is we want the top like 99th percentile technical ability. Mm. Uh, if you can get through all of that, we pay at the 80th percentile in cash. We have great equity. We have great benefits. And we have a platform that is probably the best engineers in the world are at. We're capitalized. We have robot robots. You're going to be able to train the fleet of them. Uh, and we have, um, soon we'll be deploying next several years into real large corporates in the U.S. Um, you, ha- you have a chance to work on a platform like that here. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think the folks here are hoping that we can get that done (laughs) we're all we're all like um we all think it's possible but we also have this burden to we we just got to demonstrate it like the only like we have a view i have a saying here it's like the only way out is through we have just got to show the world this works and it's got to work it's got to be safe it's got to be reliable it's got to be low cost it's got to be high Mm -hmm. performance like it's not like okay here's the robot it's walking around which we just showed like that's far from the goalpost still. We have yeah, so right. much work to do to integrate this safely. Uh, and then once all that happens, we have to manufacture a very high volume, like we have volume manufacturing scale similar to automotive. And then you have to manage a fleet of robots learning continuously in the market, uh, which is you know, uh, a different learning curve we have to go through at that point. So it's just, you know, there are, there are challenges all along the way to make this happen. It's not... You know, it's not clear if we solve this problem today, we're we're in the we're, you know, we're okay. We have like you know, there's a lot yeah, of work right. left to go do, and I think there's a certain person that we're looking for that really thrives in that environment, and there's a lot that just don't. Yeah, that's 
So true. Let me share a story of mission focus, purpose, and leadership. Matt Biggie, a rare breed of VC, who has served our country in the U.S. Army's 10th Mountain Division, served as a distinguished infantry officer, both airborne and ranger qualified. He knows something about commitment and courage. Matt channels that same dedication into the world of tech, VC, and entrepreneurship. He's not just any investor. He's a true founder operator, having played both roles and served our country honorably in uniform. He brings a unique perspective to venture capital. I'm proud to call him a friend and mentor. Matt joined Crosslink Capital as a partner in 2016. Crosslink was founded in San Francisco in 1989 with $4.2 billion under management, experienced over 50 exits, 17 IPOs, and they focus on seed and Series A investments. They write checks between $1 and $9 million of initial investments, and they are North American focused. A selection of their portfolio includes Copa, BetterUp, Enigma, and Crossbow. Matt focuses his venture investments on areas like cybersecurity and digital transformation. He has experienced successes like Veridin and CloudShield, but most importantly, his reputation among founders is rock solid. Matt is behind numerous success stories in the tech landscape with an impressive portfolio of category-defining companies. Crosslink and Matt's impact on the venture scene is profound. I'm grateful to know him, work with him, and learn alongside him and the team at Crosslink Capital. Matt is a passionate baseball fan and dedicates his time to the Honor Foundation, where he assists special operation veterans in transitioning to the civilian world. To learn more about Matt and Crosslink Capital, please visit crosslinkcapital.com. You are hyper-focused, vigilant, and obsessed with shipping product. Product, 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 product. Where in your, where in your tenure of a builder did that become, it sounds like there's a lesson there. There's a learned experience about focusing on just shipping product, shipping product, shipping product. When did that happen to you? This this is something that really confuses, confused me and I think confuses everybody in the world where um, people feel like, you know, being successful in your career and all this means like you're managing people, you're in the side like office mm-hmm. corner suite. Um you're, you know, wearing a suit every day coming in like that is just couldn't be further from what's really true. Like the worldwide right now, most mm-hmm. companies are getting eaten by software, by AI, by new startups, like everywhere in the world. Mm-hmm. And for me, one of the, probably the most important things I've learned in my career is that the, the best folks at this stuff are the folks that are at the core thinking about the first order engineering and thinking about the product and spending all their time on it. If you look at the best CEOs and the best builders in the world, they are not the person that was like the CFO that got the CEO got fired and he moves up. They are the person that can go in and they can have a big hammer. They have a lot of conviction behind an idea. Uh, They really believe in that and they make it, they force their will to make that product unbelievable. Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, yep. Jeff Bezos. Like these are like the the best folks at what they do in the world. And I think for me, that became really apparent in my software days. We're like, that's really all that matters. It doesn't matter getting the TechCrunch article. It doesn't matter about, you know, like um this like going to this event, presenting on stage. Um, podcast we talked about when we first started, like how important that is. Like we're on here now, right? Is that like, you know, what is my time here for an hour and a half versus like getting back on the floor and enable my team yeah. to get better and unblocking things for them and solving problems? Like, I think uh, this is probably the biggest secret, uh, well hidden in entrepreneurship is that um, the best people in the world can get their hands dirty and they're really good at it. And there's very few people in the limit that can um, demonstrate this reliably over their career. That's right. You know, the, the, the absolute alignment is something I talk about a lot with founders. And, and if I were to go up to anybody at this company right now behind you, walk up to a desk and say, hey, what are you what are you working on? And do you know what you're working on next week at Monday? I have a feeling they would tell me exactly what they're working on next week at Monday and where they hope to be, because I always say that leadership trickles down. So I'm pretty sure you're crystal clear on that as well, just as as your folks are. Um, how did it get that way? How do you trickle down the level of focus that you have down into the organization 
in a very tactical way. Like I'd love for founders to understand and learn from you how intentional you're being about the practicality of knowing what we're doing this Monday, next Monday, and then five Mondays, our company's going to look like this five Mondays from now. Yeah, I would like to say that I woke up one day and I knew all the answers. Right. And I've been doing this for a long time. The truth of it is that I failed and learned from those failures for 20 years. Mm-hmm. And I was very bad at some things a long time ago. And I'm still bad at some things now. And I'm trying to get better at all those things. Uh, so I've learned from all of this. Like I've learned from capital raising, building product, building teams, recruiting, retention of those talent, culture. Uh, how to scale an organization like, you know, Vettery went from 30 to 309 months. Archer went from 50 to 500 in like a year. Uh, spun up an organization here in six months, a figure of 40 people uh, within mm. six months. And then we deployed a robot in under 12 months that was walking. Like, so I think that was like, um, and not an overnight success. Uh, I think my focus now and the intentions, I guess, of what I do here at Figure are fundamentally um an output of uh all of those like like life experiences that i've had building mm-hmm. and the overall um yeah the overall lessons that i yeah, the, my overall um kind of gut feel whatever i think is the right thing to be spending time on mm-hmm. um but we're i would say everything here comes back to like what is the goal and the intention like what is the shared objective across the whole team do I know that? Does my team know that? Like, do we have like a shared understanding of that experience? If my team can understand that, my team can get it done. Mm-hmm. My team doesn't need one on one. We don't do one on ones here. Uh, mm-hmm. We don't sit around and ask how it's going. My team, like, they're the best at what they do. They need to know what to do. As long as there's a shared understanding of that, we we can get this. We can get this done. Mm-hmm. So we spend a lot of my time making sure we have this um, common vision. So we set both annual, we set like long-term goals, which you can read on the site. It's the master plan. I wrote about it. No secrets. Um, we set annual goals here. Yeah. Uh, every 30 days, we paste on like a 10 by 10 foot of paper next to the kitchen what we're doing for the next 30 days across every group. Hmm. It's like it's like laid out like a Gantt chart. And then everything we need to do, all the dependencies and all the different objectives. Every week, we demonstrate internally do an internal demo to me where the product's at. And uh, I want to see it. I want to see the whole system brought up and what it looks like. And then mm-hmm. every day at 9.15, we do a stand-up around that sheet of paper to talk about how we can fix problems, what's blocking us, um, where should we reallocate resources to, um, are we spending our time wisely across every area of the business. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I would say... I would say at this point we got it dialed in here pretty well and constantly paranoid to make sure we're on the right track is like, I think that's what's going to kill us is being on the wrong track with time will kill us here. Uh, so making sure we're intentional about where we spend our time on and is it the right stuff we're spending our time on today? Cause we're 63 people. We can't, we can't do everything. So, that's right. you know, yeah. we don't have time to, you know, go off and do events and other things. We just gotta, we gotta focus and where we're going to spend our focus on is what um, I think intentionally we, if you come in here, we're intentionally focused the ship product and move fast. That's right. Uh, so being from the Midwest, being from Illinois, th- this reference popped into my head. And I and Doug Collins, who is Michael Jordan's first head coach at the Bulls, he has a quote that I think about often when I'm speaking with just you know extraordinary people. He said, the, the greatest respect you can give a great player is to coach him and coach him hard. Um, so I'd love to know, who's your coach? Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I, I've I never had a mentor really in 20 years. Really? And I think um, not because I just don't want one or haven't been, I just like have never, for whatever reason, um, have never had that like help. And mm. um, I think there's been certain times through my career where there was a, somebody there that was uh, extremely helpful. Yeah. Um, but I've really never had this like Oracle advisor where I can go to right. that like right. could, could like help me out. And I think, you know, there's definitely been times that when you rewind the tapes, like this person came in, they were an advisor to me at Vettery and they really helped us scale the organization from 30 to 300. Great. And, 
has that person, you know, been helpful in other areas outside of that? No. Uh, do I wish they were? Yes. Uh, mm-hmm. And I, you know, I have a lot of, this is like close to me because I, I close to my heart because I feel like I have, I have 30 emails, 30 messages per week of entrepreneurs that were me 15 years ago that are asking for my help. Mm-hmm. They're asking for me to be a, a mentor, uh, right. to ask questions to, um, to be a board member or whatever. And I just don't have the time for it. Like, okay. and I didn't have that. And I feel like I need, I, I, I really wanted that a long time ago and I still do. Right. Like I, I'd be great right. to have somebody to talk to, um, and, you know, just get overall advice from, I definitely, we definitely do have a really strong board and investors here. I mean, you've been mm-hmm. really helpful. A lot of other folks have been really helpful uh, mm-hmm. here. Um, but I think it's just something that's been missing through my whole career. Um, yeah. Who has done something that has inspired you? I think there's a lot of really great people throughout history that are not alive today that are just, yeah, that I would say that are, I would say really, um, um, that have really demonstrated a lot of great success, have good personal values that I look up to. And I think there's some folks, you know, in our lifetime right now that if I would say I look at and say they've made a very significant contribution to humanity and I'm mm. really glad they exist. And I think that's, you know, Steve Jobs, I think it's Elon Musk. It's those characters like that that have devoted, that have made personal sacrifices mm-hmm. to push great product in the world to help. And I think, um, when you look at the sacrifices they made and the determination they had over decades to make that happen and their repeated success in their career, these were not like one trick pony groups. There are one, a lot of one trick pony, very successful, like, uh, internet entrepreneurs that are still mm-hmm. successful today, billionaires mm-hmm. that probably can't do it again. And the folks that I mentioned earlier are folks that, but if they had time and focus, they could probably solve a, a, a vast variety of really important things in the world. And um, it takes a really unique person that has been devoted for decades of their life to hone that talent to be able to do that. And um, yeah, it's it's just really great to see those companies, you know, Apple, SpaceX, Tesla. These are just like um, the greatest companies of our generation uh, built by the greatest entrepreneurs that uh, have been around in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. What's the most common piece of advice that you were sought out to give from those founders that are reaching out to you? If you were to tranche it, the founders need help on the details. Mm -hmm. They need help, not on, um, generally they don't need help on like picking ideas or, uh, getting going. They need help on, um, you know, what is the process for raising capital? Um, how do I, you know, when I think about building my engineering organization, should it be, um, you know, kind of like maybe a functional product driven organization or a matrix driven organization as really staffing different levels of engineering talent across these different groups? Mm-hmm. Um, I would say the, there's a high degree of variability across all those requests, but they just, they, they just want technical help on, I have a certain area. How do I scale my B2B sales process? How do I build an engineering organization that can tackle this? How do I think about my product timeline over time and how fast I should iterate through it? And of what mm-hmm. fidelity should I try to hit my requirements? There's just a broad range of help yeah. that they would they would need that they're looking at. They're trying to locally problem solve. And those are things that in my life I've come across that I have sometimes made big mistakes on. Um, and sometimes I've made the right calls on and have learned that um can be helpful um the the problem a bit becomes if i tell you the answer is that net beneficial for an entrepreneur and i think at this point in my career i do that versus them finding it out on their own right you have to get really good at idea generation you have to get really good at solving problems because that's your job as a ceo your job is not to sit back and you know your job is to solve problems every day and you basically have this funnel of all the worst problems floating to you And you are the person, that's your job, is to take this like shit funnel of things that are really hard in the world and go solve them for your company and to Mm -hmm. make changes, to use the hammer that you have, which is really large as a CEO, to uh, divert the company's resources or your time to fixing those. And yeah, I would say these are things that an entrepreneur, a good entrepreneur has to be able to... 
to recursively uh, identify, solve, evaluate, and then replan themselves as an agent, or else you're in the limit or just not going to be able to do this long enough. That's right. So I think yeah. in some way it's like you kind of want to throw an entrepreneur uh, in the woods and they need right. to figure out how to feed themselves and fend for themselves. That's yeah. what will make a really good entrepreneur. That's the or that's the that's my background. I grew up where nobody wanted to fund me, nobody wanted to talk to me. I had no mentors. Like I wanted all of that. I had right. I had none of it. And in some way, that I feel like uh, was like the biggest um, gift of all in my career. Mm. So th- there's you know you've heard this a million times. How you do the small things is how you do everything. Uh, what are the small things? that you focus on as a leader for the folks behind you, for them to focus on consistently. You mean as it relates to my team here or correct? Yes. Yeah. I think the, the goal of a CEO needs to be um, instilling a common vision of what needs to get done like what's the goal? What's like what's the mission mm-hmm. vision of what you're trying to do to your team? Mm-hmm. And it needs to be extremely qu- clear where everybody understands it. it. Needs to be documented. It needs to be communicated. It needs to be instilled yes. in the team. If folks, if the best folks in the world that really want that care, like this mm-hmm. intangible aspect of caring what you do, and they can problem local, um, low level trade offs are extremely challenging. You have to have like this mm-hmm. system mindset to say, well. If I add this part to the system, it's going to be net beneficial for a mechanical engineer because it's going to solve this mechanical problem I have in the hand, but it's going mm-hmm. to increase mass. It's going to make the robot heavier. It'll be harder to manufacture. It's now uh, a single a, a point of failure, single point of failure in the system. I have to procure that. I have to maintain it. I have a bomb cost now, a supply chain mm-hmm. to go by. Like It's just a lot of bloat in the system. Yeah. So you really want... Uh, to train everybody on how to be basically what I call like a chief engineer in the system. Mm. Uh, so how do you become like a mini CEO of all these different areas? And I think that's where you build the best organizations and people really thrive in that environment. Um, and it's, I would say, extremely difficult to build an environment like that uh, yeah. as a company. That's kind of where everybody hopes they can get to that. Um, yeah, that I would say extremely challenging to get to and extremely challenging to maintain or make better over time as you're growing, it, you know, if you're growing the organization. So shared moments are obviously, uh, you know, a lot better to, to, successes in shared moments are much better shared together. And as soon as you got a team on board, how do you celebrate wins at the company with one another? Yeah, you have to, um, it's it just it's just unculturally. You have to be able to understand the milestones and the effort your team is putting in, and we have to be able to acknowledge that. And um, I think the biggest win a company like this that we're building can have is shipping product and people seeing they're actually making an impact. It's the truth, right? Yeah, uh, they they don't need a pat on the back. Like I think yeah. we want to celebrate these things in the organization and uh, be extremely respectful and um, understand where people need to be. Uh, uh, you know, where people need to be rewarded for that great work, but yes. the folks here know what know know what success looks like. Uh, the mm-hmm. biggest dream everybody has here is putting, in the case of Figure, robots into the real world that are safe and helping humanity. Like that's the yeah. biggest gift I can give my team. So what do I need to do? I need to tell them exactly what I think needs to happen here for what we're doing, mm-hmm. what we mm-hmm. will and what we will and won't do. We will we will ship into civilians. Uh, Household, we will ship into commercial stuff. We will not do anything military. We won't even touch it. And mm-hmm. that's the decision I have to make. It's a decision mm-hmm. that we're very, very strong on. We won't even do phone calls. So mm-hmm. I think um, with that now vision, uh, the team can go out and do what they do best and get product in the world and make an extreme level of impact, hopefully, long term. And that's what folks at Figure want. And that would mm-hmm. be different for, I would say, every company. Um, what would they would, you know, how people feel rewarded and feel purpose. But folks here uh, feel purpose on hopefully getting that done. We are a long ways from that because we're a year and a half in. But that's I, that's what my team would like to do. Um, and then you know we celebrate the wins locally. I mean, we were mm-hmm. here the last three nights in a row. We were here till one thirty in the morning, and 
two, the first two nights, we just like, nothing worked well. Like the robot, just like we were integrating all the new perception systems, manipulation yep. policies, AI training stuff. Uh, we were doing a bunch of stuff with like um, like path planning and obstacle avoidance for the robot, so we can actually navigate through the real world. Mm-hmm. Um, object object detection from the perception. It, we were integrating all this stuff in, and everything was breaking. And then mm-hmm. last night at eleven to one thirty in the morning, we were just in this miraculous period where everything was working. We figured out why we were making issues. And we just, we had like, you know, it was great. We had a big celebration at 1.30. Uh, then we hit the, hit the bed and came back in and we were talking about this morning, how we just like hit a big milestone. Morale is extremely high. That's what people ended up wanting, wanting to do. The dopamine's great for that team. And, yes. uh, but, but longer term, like we need to ship product into market for that dopamine levels to be high for the team. But um, yeah, I said culturally, I think we just need to be extremely respectful and give people what they want. And people, what they want here is what they sign up for when they end up joining figure. That's right. So how do you hope, these are two last final questions that I that are important to me and, and folks that are listening for sure. I always become energized to talk about and recognize a different kind of VC firm. I'm speaking about my friends and the investors at 8VC. They partner with elite founders to build transformational technologies that create long-term economic and societal value. Something unique to their culture, they are investors who never stop being engineers, operators, policymakers, philosophers, and entrepreneurs. They are equally fervent realists and optimists with an irreverence for convention and reverence for wisdom. So then enter uh, a friend, Joe Lonsdale and Alex Moore, both friends and teammates who I've known for nearly a decade. And on a personal note, Joe and Alex were among the very first VCs to back my first mission at the Honor Foundation or honor.org. Joe hosted events at both his home and the firm to support special operations in finding careers inside of the technology space. Joe Lonsdale is not simply a successful investor, but someone who sees beyond the horizon. He was a co-founder at Palantir, and now we are invested alongside each other in companies like Anderil and Epirus. Joe has crafted a legacy, making indelible marks on the defense and intelligence landscapes Yet the chapters didn't just end there. He has founded and co-founded other such stories as Opto Investments and Adipar, who oversees a staggering $4 trillion, and OpenGov, which seeks to transform the civic space. Joe's investments are a testimony to a relentless pursuit of transformative change. Also, I admire some of 8BC's values, and the values that emerge from this narrative is take it personally. Our work is our art. And second, stewardship and patriotism. We believe in the American experiment, that its ideals are worth striving for and its people and institutions are worth defending. At 8VC, it's not just about the destination, but the journey. The stories of those who dare, those who dream, and those who defy. To learn more about my friends at 8VC, please visit their website at 8vc.com. Like, how do you hope the world looks at your life's work many years from now? Like, what would you like to be known as and known for? I, my life goal is just to try to help as much as I can while I'm here. I just want to make as much impact as possible. And I, I just want to wake up every day excited and inspired of what I work on. I think it's also... There's a matter of, like there's certain problems you want to solve, and it's really important. And for, you know, we should be doing that. But there's something else to like be able to like wake up to a world that we're all excited about and inspired. And we can build that world. Mm-hmm. If we don't build it, it will get worse for sure. We will mm-hmm. forget how to build the pyramids. We will forget how to build aqueducts. It's happened throughout history. Yes. Uh, technology does not move forward unless you force it to, with blood, sweat, and tears. So. Uh, we have a duty, a moral duty, to shape the world the way we want it. Mm-hmm. And we can shape that world however good or however bad we want to as humans today on the planet. So my goal is to play a very small part in that process mm-hmm. and to try to, to design technology that can hopefully scale to the max market to make some sort of impact here while while I'm alive. So two more questions. One more is. Um, why should people consider coming to work for figure? 
I, I, you know, I want to say like, maybe, maybe they shouldn't. I like, we have, a um, you know, part of my job here too, is like making sure people really understand what they're getting into, uh, talking people out of coming. Mm-hmm. Um, we really want folks that are really dedicated to what we do. The pitch here is that you get the chance to work on probably the, um, most advanced AI and robotics project on the planet. We have a chance to put humanoid robots into everyday life worldwide. We have a chance, probably in the limit, to work on artificial general intelligence uh, in the physical world, or embodied AI. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to be an extremely fun project. I think it's going to be really hard, but it seems like there is signs over the next like three or four years that we see clearly that we can just can start working. Um, like The next two to three years, like it's pretty clear that we can do this. Mm-hmm. Beyond that, it gets foggy. Like, what does five years, ten years look like? Nobody really knows. We don't know. Mm-hmm. We think we know the direction, but it's just like super unclear until we start demonstrating the next few years and getting those checked off. Um, we pay well here. You'll work with the best teams in the world. You'll work hard. Um, mm-hmm. You'll have a lot of ownership. You'll have a lot of impact. Um, you'll have a lot of equity, hopefully, in the business and make a lot of money if this works. Um, but more so like you get to work on a really fun project that hopefully is transformative for people's lives over the coming decades. And, you know, I'll be the first to say, we're not really trying to convince everybody of that to come here. Uh, we're honestly trying to look for these special people that, you know, we come to the office every day. Like we have a mandatory come to the office policy. Like most Mm -hmm. of the world today wants to be remote and, I get that. Like it's it's great. Like um, I'm not trying to say that like, remote work is bad and you got to come off as good. But what's good for us is being here to be able to uh, share and communicate and work on hardware. Like that's mm-hmm. you know we have to be in the office. Most of the world that supplies manufacturing and food service, everybody's going to the world office. Yes. We're in the office here, so yeah. I think you know 95 percent of the world doesn't want to do that. So right, right. away, right away. So like we're not trying to like change that mentality. We're trying to look for the very few here and there and over the yes. world that like, hey, do you want to come here and work on this ridiculous project with us and work really hard and make sacrifices? And uh, that's where we're out scoured, like you know, scouring the world, boiling mm-hmm. the ocean on the recruiting side, on the marketing side, on the brand side, and the engineering side to, to try to find. And mm-hmm. um, you know, thankfully we have thousands of people that apply to here work yep. here. Uh, and we, we have what we think is probably the pick of the top engineering minds in the world, whether they're coming from Google DeepMind, Boston Dynamics, uh, you know, uh, Tesla, wherever, uh, they're coming, Apple SPG, they're coming from the best groups in the world. Uh, they're there because they want to be high impact in their career. They're generally wanting to go and they're like a magnet, these groups to those places. They want to go work at Tesla. They want to go work on Apple's self-driving car program. They want to make personal sacrifice in their life to work at SpaceX. Um, generally that's, you know, we're looking for the same type of folks that want to have that impact and, um, dive in. So yeah, I think we're just not, we're not trying to convince the whole world that this is right for them. Hmm. I, I have a, just a personal question on this part. I mean, have you, have you called Elon and been like, Hey, so like, how's your robot doing? And has he called you and be like, Hey, so how's your robot doing? <laughs> no, I have not talk to Elon about uh our humanoid projects um but like i really hope that uh he does well um the humanoid stuff is you know great i'm a huge fan of like what he's been doing in his projects and i think he's just like one of the greatest builders in the world and um but no we haven't um had a conversation around our humanoids yet but there's it's funny like we're like really close to, like the tesla prototype right. lab. uh it's like an unmarked next street so yeah, I, I guess if like this, like you know, if we can't ship into clients and this doesn't work, at least we can like you know have the robots meet and just you know uh, <laughs> bat- battle it out because we're so close together. But uh, but yeah, no, I I hope they uh, I I you know I've, I saw some things aligned. Looks like they're doing really well, and um, and uh, yeah, just huge fan of what he's what he's been building uh, last few few century, few decades. So last last question: the logo. What does that mean? Talk me through that. So we I spent a lot of time uh, up front uh, before mm-hmm. like all this was in place, building the brand. I think that's extremely yep. important. The brand is like a message. It's a uh, it's a way you build the the, the brand is also a derivative of how much trust you build with people, uh, what you say, what you do. Um, so both at you know Vettery, my last software company, Archer Aviation, which I founded in 2018, and now Figure, t- founded in 2022. 
I spent an enormous amount of time on the name, the brand, the website, the messaging, the vision, yeah. vision, value, all the stuff. Like it's almost like a foundational piece. You, you do it, you do it once really well, and that, that that can really grow and it's really important. So um, we spent a lot of time up front on what are all those areas. We, from a name perspective uh, and like logo and everything else, we wanted something that was iconic. Uh, we wanted something that was easy uh, mm-hmm. and um almost like somewhat simple uh and also unique and yeah. um uniqueness is important as we build that brand out in a very cluttered you know environment in the world the world's like the signal noise is really um uh low and <laughs> a lot yeah. of noise in the world for you know trying to build a product and introducing this yeah. into people's lives uh figure in the name is just like the human figure which were obviously you know um mm. really important to us uh it's you know it's very easy to say pronounce uh we think it's really unique we like the word um, and then the figure logo is basically an extrapolation of the word F. And um, it also kind of symbolizes a lot of the way the foot placements work and a lot of the works, work that we do in, say, simulation and sure. uh, like, like path planning for footsteps and other placements. So, um, And I would say it's relatively uh, unique, and we think we can build an iconic brand off of where this thing sits. So uh, we try our best, like after the, this is the website you go to and the way we look and present ourselves. And yes. You know, the investment materials, everything else is like everything extremely branded. We try to be, um, you know, we kind of talk about, you know, this, you know, a year and a half ago when we started the brand is like we, we want to almost feel like, quote, IP already from day one. Yeah. Uh, we want to feel like you're very presentable, very professional, build the brand. And then we used to have build trust. We have to go out and do the things we say we do uh, and do it the right way uh, from a values perspective. So that's, you know, the feeling you have around brands is ultimately a reflection on, on those key uh, heuristics. Yes. Yes. I can't tell you how much I agree with that. And for all the founders that are listening to this podcast, I think what he just said is so important because folks that are crystal clear on a vision, you have to be able to package that and show it to people so they understand what you're trying to build and where you're trying to go. So I completely understand with packaging up the vision, mission values in such a way that you can bring people into your vision tangibly and have them feel what you're thinking in your mind. Well, I certainly can't uh, wait to get to work on behalf of the company. Brett, thanks for your time today, man. I know you're anxious to get back to the to the warehouse floor. Uh, and I can't wait to come and visit you guys uh, out in San Francisco and and get to meet uh, the bot itself. Great. Well, um, thanks for everything, Joe. It's been you know great having you an investor on the, on the ride. And yeah, I look forward to touching base soon. All right, man. Thank you so much. Have an awesome week. I'll talk to you soon. Remember, This equation is your quiet guide and blueprint for building extraordinary teams, leadership, and culture. Continue exploring these ideas along your journey, and please follow us on YouTube or wherever podcasts are found. Until next time, stay extraordinary.